they're where the rubber meets the road. The crucial interface between land and sky. They're the main drag at big city airports and a thin ribbon of hope in the bush. They can be three miles long or as compact as a football field. Now, runways on Modern Marvels. This might be the most underappreciated piece of infrastructure in America. Bridges and tunnels get all the oohs and odds, but runways are the backbone of the aviation industry, which is the backbone of the transportation industry. Every day, 175,000 aircraft take off and touch down on runways in the U.S. Everything sort of revolves around the runway. Every pilot that goes out there, trust the airport proprietor, air traffic control, that they have 9,400 feet of absolutely the safest runway that we can provide for them. Runways aren't really the most glamorous of structures, certainly, but they do form the basis of the air transportation system. I mean, you really have to get down and get up uh, from somewhere. So they are, of course, very important. I've been flying for 20 years. And uh, the first thing you have to learn is how to take it off and how to put it back on the ground. All the rest of your mission, you learn later. But if you can't get it in the air and get it on the ground, uh, you can't go any further than that. Before we go any further, let's make one thing perfectly clear. Runways are never under any circumstances to be confused with ordinary roads or even the interstate. In terms of layout, construction, and design, the runway is to the interstate as the interstate is to an urban sidewalk. And for the same reason, sidewalk, highway, and runway each have to handle progressively greater loads of stress. The runway must accept tremendous forces on it. The landing of a 500,000 pound aircraft going in excess of 140 miles an hour puts a tremendous strain on the runway structural limitations. So the runway has to be elastic. It has to be built in such a way that can accept this huge weight and accept the heat that's generated by the stopping aircraft and not the form. So it's very complicated. The complications begin in the planning stage. Before any paving is poured, a host of ground, subsoil, line of sight, and wind studies must be conducted. Planes need wind to take off and land into, and surveyors have to draw up a wind rose a map of wind patterns that will dictate the layout of the airstrip. A precise assessment of surrounding terrain, including mountains and skyscrapers, is also critical to make sure that planes will have room to clear such obstacles in time. Runways are made of either concrete, which lasts longer and has less give, or asphalt, which is cheaper but requires more maintenance. Deciding what kind of finish to put on the asphalt or concrete is a crucial call. That's because runway slickness, caused by everything from rain, snow, and ice, to oil, to tire skid marks in the touchdown zone, is a huge concern for everyone, from tire and plane manufacturers, to NASA, to the FAA, all of whom have conducted extensive runway weather and skid tests. If you think driving the freeway in a storm is dicey, imagine breaking through dense clouds about 10 seconds before hitting a snow-covered runway at 160 miles an hour. This hydraulic sled track at NASA's Aircraft Landing Dynamics Facility in Hampton, Virginia, is used to simulate high-speed landings in torrential rainfall of up to 40 inches an hour. It was here in the 1960s that researchers came up with an invaluable weapon in the fight against runway skid. Grooving. Creating narrow runoff canals in the paving through which water can drain is a simple but revolutionary idea that has changed the look and texture of runways. As the airplane operating speeds increase, they couldn't get rid of the water fast enough 
and hence there would be a pressure buildup that would lift the tire off the pavement, much like a water skier. And we felt that if we added channels to get the water off of the runway quicker, that would help solve the problem. Grooving is now used on 800 runways in the U.S. and on thousands of miles of highway throughout the country. In case grooving fails, some airports, especially those with runways that abut large bodies of water, have adopted a last line of defense against runway skid. This styrofoam-like bed developed by the FAA was installed in 1998 to keep planes at New York's LaGuardia from sliding into Flushing Bay. Clearly, runways have come a long way since the early days of aviation, when planes were so light that they could touch down and rumble to a stop on farms and meadows. The typical runway has actually evolved from a grass field, and if they were really pressing for efficiency, they mowed the grass. But sooner or later, as, as aircraft evolved, uh, they found that the grass called adi uh, caused additional drag on the wheels of the airplanes, so they went to bare dirt surfaces. Dirt was better, as long as the skies were clear. But landing on dirt in a heavy rain was a risky proposition. If you were the unfortunate victim that was the first lander and you didn't know what the condition of the field was, and your wheels sunk into mud up to the hubs, you know, when you were still going 40 or 60 miles an hour, it could really be disastrous. The next logical step was the paved runway, which was little more than a paved highway and first appeared at the end of the 1920s. Made of concrete, this revolutionary advance enabled pilots to make all-weather takeoffs and landings at any time of day or night. Until the 1930s, many smaller airlines landed on water. One of the first passenger airlines was a seaplane service in St. Petersburg, Florida, flying boats, as they were called, at a smooth, reinforced underbelly and needed just a few hundred feet of calm sea to land and dock. But landing on water, in effect, a moving runway, was full of hazards. And many lives were lost in the 30s when pilots dipped their wings into high waves and tumbled to destruction. By the end of the decade, water had given way almost entirely to concrete. LaGuardia, the first major airport in the US, was built in 1939 and boasted two landmark runways, each nearly a mile long. But even that wasn't long enough for the new generation of bigger, heavier planes spawned by World War II, and the ascendancy of jets in the 1950s and 60s, which doubled the weight of previous planes. Overnight, runways too would have to double in size. Jet age runways for the new jet age. The jet age of the 1960s turned air traffic into mass traffic and triggered a revolution in airport and runway design. Dulles International was the first jet age airport in the US. Cleared for takeoffs in 1962, Dulles boasted three runways, two of which stretched out an unprecedented two miles. The 1960s were a boom period for runway construction. Old runways had to be extended and widened, and new runways had to be built to handle the increase in traffic and the immense stresses of the latest jets. Laying down a thick coat of concrete for a two-mile runway that was, with shoulders, nearly as wide as a football field was no small task. And runway contractors were quick to adopt slip-form paving, a streamlined technique developed by the highway industry as the preferred means of tackling the job. With slip-form, paving is continuous. The wet concrete is dumped in front of the paving apparatus, where it is churned and then shaped into a solid slab a few yards away in the rear. The paver moves a foot and a half a minute, or about 10,000 feet in five days. Keeping the process going is all important, since any stop risks a bump in the runway. Because slip form uses a very stiff mix of concrete, the paving can be laid out without fixed side forms to hold the wet slab in place. This runway, constructed in Atlanta's Municipal Airport in 1969, was laid out in 25-foot wide, two-mile long strips. Six strips were laid side to side to complete the job. Unlike today's runway mixes, which can be ready for traffic in one to three days, 
1960s concrete usually took two weeks to set. In order to toughen the runway for the punishment to come, a steel mesh was placed between eight inch layers of concrete. The mesh spreads the stress loads of landing craft. Dowel bars were also strategically placed to connect adjacent slabs. The 21st century so far is still the age of jets, and runways today are constructed in much the same way as in the 1960s, and to the same general specifications. They range in thickness from 6 to 50 inches, depending on the weight and intensity of the traffic they'll have to bear. But they are not evenly thick throughout. The biggest loading, of course, is uh, in the touchdown areas, uh, roughly 2,000 feet on either end of the runway. That can amount to several hundred thousand pounds in a relatively small tire contact area. And uh, hence, they normally have the thickness of the pavement in those touchdown areas uh, greater than what they have in the middle portion. Creating a smooth grade is critical in runway construction since planes landing at high speeds will turn even minor variations into a roller coaster ride. The stringline technique, in which surveyors set up a line on either side of the paver to trace the desired grade of the runway, is the most popular. A wand from the paver touches the line, measuring changes in elevation, and the machine hydraulically adjusts the height of its paving pan to make the smoothest, most even surface possible. A smooth runway is just one aspect of what makes a safe runway, and runway safety is an enormous concern, especially after construction, when the runway is running. That's because, ironically, the time a plane spends on the ground can be one of the most dangerous parts of air travel. Runway collisions between planes have killed 49 people in the U.S. since 1990, although only six since early 1991. And incursions, violations of runway space by aircraft and other vehicles, hit an all-time high of 431 in 2000. There were 383 such incidents in 2001. In fact, the worst commercial crash in aviation history was caused by a runway smash-up in Tenerife in the Canary Islands in 1977, when two 747s collided on takeoff, killing 583 people. There are some airports that have what have clearly become known as hot spots, where repeated incursions, whether they be pilot deviations where a pilot made an error or a vehicle uh, making a runway incursion or going someplace on the airport where they're not supposed to. Those hot spots have been identified on those airports, made a matter of record, and uh, the FAA and the airport proprietors work really hard as a team to, to fix those areas. Human error is the main cause of runway incursions. And since the mid-90s, both the FAA and NASA have been developing crash warning systems designed to keep pilots on top of airfield traffic. Like this advanced cockpit display system created at NASA's Langley Research Center. The system uses GPS signals, traffic sensors, and NASA software to create an electronic moving map that shows and sounds an alert whenever an incursion is about to take place. Another serious but sometimes subtle danger on runways comes in the form of rubbish, or FOD, which is the acronym for foreign objects and debris. Rubbish, chunks of asphalt or concrete, loose bits of rubber can all wreak havoc in the engines of a jet. FOD has been a factor in 29 accidents in the U.S. since 1990, seven of them deadly. It was fod in the form of a 16-inch piece of metal that had fallen off another plane that caused the supersonic Concorde to crash outside Paris in 2000, killing all 109 passengers and crew. The metal punctured the Concorde's front tire, firing heavy chunks of rubber into the jet's fuel tanks, which ignited. With our jet engines pushing through so much air, they act like vacuum cleaners on the front. And if your jet engine is mounted on your jet so that it's low enough, it can just pick a rock right up off the ground and suck it through the engine, and uh, that in itself causes a lot of damage. Objects 
must be uh, attended to at all times at an airport, day and night, because frankly, the pilot cannot see it when he lands. It is simply too small, and the landing evolution is too quick for a pilot to be able to discern objects on the runway. Many airports use special suction vehicles that can pick up pebbles and loose turf where they conduct pod sweeps. In between, inspectors make daily runs across the airfield, eyeballing for FOD. But they have to be quick about it. With planes taking off and landing every two minutes, there's not a very large window of opportunity before the inspector himself becomes a piece of FOD. We're going about 100 right now. We're nearing the end of the runway here. Everything looks good up until now. Okay, runway inspection is complete. One of the most dangerous, common, and least publicized hazards to runway safety is posed by birds. Meet Elvis, a falcon that patrols the skies around McConnell Air Force Base in Wichita, Kansas, keeping the airspace safe for planes by terrifying other birds. Falcons are very effective on some species of birds, uh, especially these smaller birds that are out here, uh, gulls, uh, they're, they all recognize him as a natural predator, and they all just leave the area. A handful of airports have resorted to falcons, including JFK, which has one of the most serious bird problems in the country and employs no less than 15 falcons to help clear the skies. McConnell, which sits beneath a major migrating route for geese, ducks, and other waterfowl, has about 100 bird strikes a year. Overall in the U.S., no less than 43,000 bird strikes with civil aircraft have been reported since the FAA began keeping records in 1990. Officials believe that most bird strikes are unreported and that the actual number is five times that high. Total damage from bird strikes to commercial air carriers each year worldwide is $1.2 billion. Every airport that has birds in the vicinity must contend with the likelihood that birds will fly through the operating airspace and present a hazard to aircraft on landing and approach, either by being ingested in the, in the engine or striking the aircraft windscreen or surface and causing a deformity and damage to the aircraft. There are many reasons for the dramatic rise in bird plane collisions in recent years. For one thing, jet engines are more powerful than ever and can suck up just about anything that crosses their path. They're also quieter than ever, making it harder for birds to detect aircraft and get out of their way. For another, the population levels of many once rare species have exploded in the U.S., especially around marshland and open fields, just the kind of terrain that airports frequently border. 90% of all bird strikes are with birds protected by federal law, like red-tailed hawks, Canada geese, and sandhill cranes. Probably the most significant uh, in terms of damage are the ones that go into the engines. We took a bird in one of the engines, and we were too far down the runway to stop, so we went on around and came back and stopped, only to discover, uh, upon the shutdown, uh, about a quarter million dollars worth of damage to the blades. And uh, now that's significant. Uh, what was significant to me was that the engine was still running, <laughs> and uh, I was happy with that. The bird strike problem is so serious that both the military and engine manufacturers have been testing aircraft since the 1970s, firing dead chickens and other fowl at windshields and into the engines of new jets. The military won't buy an F-16, for example, unless it can withstand a direct hit from a four-pound bird at 550 knots. The U.S. Department of Agriculture, meanwhile, has an entire research facility near Cleveland dedicated to coming up with new weapons to wield against birds. This laser holds some promise, nudging birds gently out of harm's way with a beam that birds are afraid to cross. As do these high-intensity pulsating lights that could soon be fixed to the wings of aircraft. The lights would scatter birds just quickly enough for planes and jets to make it through without a strike. Until the new tools are available, Falcons like Elvis will continue to play a crucial role at McConnell and other airstrips. These birds basically establish their territory out here. If they're flown every day, the resident populations of birds here 
start thinking, well, there's a falcon that lives out there, and so they subsequently stay away. He cost about a dollar a day to feed. He's about, you know, anywhere from $1,000 to $2,000 to buy. There's a lot of hours of time and training to go into getting where he's at. He's only flown out here for a little over a month now, so he's just getting started by, within another two months, he'll be cooking out here. Uh, he'll chase everything in sight. Helping Elvis at McConnell is an English setter named Pepper. Her job is to flush birds out of the grass that grows around the airfield. And they get along great. Pepper's a good girl. She loves it out here. I mean, she could run all day. She never gets tired. Elvis, on the other hand, is a little more temperamental. They were raised together and just get along fine. Bird strikes are such a serious and escalating problem that one entrepreneurial falconer in Canada has developed a fully functioning falcon robot that could be cheaper than live birds, since it doesn't have to be trained or maintained. Robo Falcon can fly for eight to 12 minutes, has a wingspan of between four and nine feet, and a wing beat rate of three and a half to seven beats per second. JFK, among others, has auditioned the Mechanical Predator, which comes in five sizes, costs between six to $10,000, and could one day make all the difference in the war for airspace between birds like this and birds like this. Some of the most fascinating and unusual runways can be found on America's 12 aircraft carriers, floating airports that can race to any hotspot in the world at over 30 knots. These behemoths carry a fleet of up to 80 planes, but their runways are just 400 feet long, stretching out across barely half the deck of the aircraft carrier. Space, to say the least, is at a premium. We actually take an entire city, city at sea, an airport at sea, and we condense it down uh, into that, that ship, which is uh, 1,100 feet long, and it's, it's quite an operation. It's uh, a real ballet of things going on all at the same time. Aircraft carrier runways aren't long enough for jets, which weigh up to 65,000 pounds, to lift off on their own power. So they have to be catapulted into flight. Each carrier has four steam-powered catapults, which attach by way of a slide track on the runway to a T-bar on the plane. The hydraulic engines that power the catapult are below the runway and weigh a million pounds apiece. Each one is capable of launching an aircraft from zero to 150 miles an hour in under two seconds. The, the catapults are 300 feet long and are comprised of two steel cylinders with uh, two 2,500-pound pistons inside. These, these catapults can create an amazing amount of force and will launch the aircraft off the end of the flight deck regardless of the fact that the engines are on or not. Your head is back against the, the, the headrest because the G-forces will take your head and put it back against the seat. Uh, and then as soon as you're airborne, uh, you kind of get this pause because now the acceleration has stopped and now the only thing that's driving the airplane forward is the aircraft's two engines. Landing on a runway at sea is even more hair-raising, a kind of controlled crash at very close quarters. Once again, the runway is too short for a plane to land in a conventional manner. Instead, a hook on the tail of the plane has to catch one of four arresting cables that are stretched out across the deck. It is a pretty violent stop when you're going from 140 miles an hour down to zero uh, in a matter of about 450 feet. One of the training airplane I flew when I first started flying, uh, you would get black and blue marks right here when you caught the arresting gear and the, your body wants to keep flying forward, but the airplane's gonna stop when you caught a, a wire. Making the landing even more violent is the fact that these pilots have to gun their engines on touchdown just in case they miss the wire and have to stay airborne for a second go-round. They also have to land exactly on center line. The lateral margin of error for these runways is just five feet. Any more than that, and the larger jets could clip the wings of an adjacent jet readying for takeoff. Oh yeah, did we forget to mention that these pilots have to do all this with a moving target? We need a minimum amount of wind over the flight deck. 
However, we're, we're frequently out in the Persian Gulf and there's no wind at all and the carrier has to create that wind. So the carrier will be going 25, sometimes uh, 30 knots through the water. From the perspective of the pilot orbiting overhead the carrier in preparation for landing, he's looking down watching the carrier cruise through the water 25 knots. It almost looks unreal that he's now going to land that plane on it. You can imagine the type of precision it takes to fly that and then when they come out of the fog or the clouds and see the carrier to make those last few corrections precisely and land safely on the ship. Not surprisingly, the pilots don't always manage to land. The average success rate for catching a cable is about 90%. Sometimes pilots catch the wire, but the hooking mechanism itself goes awry. Which is why the Navy is always interested in testing other specialized landing gear, like this arresting web. The idea of rigging of military vessels so that you can launch planes at sea goes back to the earliest days of aviation. A daredevil pilot flew a biplane off a warship in 1910. And a decade later, the U.S. Navy converted a coal ship with a wooden deck into the USS Langley, America's first aircraft carrier. Planes of the period were light enough to launch off the deck without the use of catapults, although launching devices were introduced in 1915. But arresting cables were critical from the start in bringing aircraft to a stop. The first steam catapults were tested in 1934, and they were barely powerful enough to keep planes aloft until they could fly under their own power. By the start of World War II, aircraft carriers were devastating war machines, each one packed with a fleet of bombers, and they played a critical role, especially in the Pacific. The Cold War spurred the development of aircraft carrier technology, and steam catapults capable of launching jets were introduced in 1954. By now, America's airport on the ocean was a forbidding symbol of power and reach. Although there were occasional failures, like this botched landing on the carrier Essex in 1956. Keeping those failures to a minimum today has a lot to do with paying constant attention to the surface of these cruising airstrips. Skid problems are a huge concern, more so than on conventional runways, since the aircraft carrier exists in an all-wet environment that can pitch and roll at any time. We've seen uh, waves that are breaking over the flight deck, 60 feet tall waves, uh, sometimes where the, the bow is pitching down plus or minus 20 feet. So we need to have an environment where the planes can move safely on the flight deck and provide good traction. Every 18 months, the steel-plated runway is resurfaced with non-skid, a texturized coating made up of metal and sand. The application of this special surface uh, takes weeks to put on. It has to be stripped down to bare metal. And then once the environmental conditions are right, we will lay this down with very specialized paint brushes to ensure that the grain is correct. And it takes about four days to cure and make the, uh, to the required hardness. So this will stand up to the pounding of aircraft and the tail hooks slamming down on the, on the surface. The slamming of the tail hooks is incessant. The maximum tempo or rate of takeoffs and landings on an aircraft carrier is two takeoffs and one landing every 37 seconds during the day. And one takeoff and landing every minute at night. America's space shuttle goes up higher and stays there longer than any other contemporary manned aircraft in the world. But the shuttle, like everything else that leaves the ground, needs a place to touch down. Now, the runway itself, of course, uh, was desired to be incredibly flat, incredibly long, and, and wide, um, because you do have, at the time, the runway was designed, uh, essentially, uh, an untested vehicle and you don't, it's not going to handle quite as nicely as an airliner. So you, you want a very long runway, very flat, very wide. The shuttle actually has two runways in the U.S. The main one at Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida, and a backup at Edwards Air Force Base in Southern California. The runway at the Kennedy Space Center is one of the longest in the world, 
15,000 feet long, with 1,000 foot overruns on each end. That's nearly three miles, or 50 football fields end to end. It's also 3,000 feet longer than the runways at JFK and LAX. The shuttle needs all that room because its braking system isn't comparable to that of conventional jets. Jets shift their engines into reverse thrust to slow themselves down. But the shuttle doesn't have jet engines. It's launched by rocket power and glides home. And so it has to rely entirely on wheel brakes, a drag chute, gravity, and a whole lot of runway room. NASA has been conducting runway tests at its aircraft landing dynamics facility in Hampton, Virginia, since the mid-1950s. Here, the hydraulically powered slide track can simulate shuttle touchdowns, testing tires and runway surfaces at the same stresses as at the Kennedy Space Center. We use a carriage, a tubular steel carriage, that weighs almost 60 tons. Uh, to get it up to speed, we fire a jet of water at the rear of this carriage and accelerate it from zero up to 250 miles an hour in just about two seconds. There's about 20 Gs of acceleration uh, during that process. And then once we get the carriage up to speed, it coasts down the remainder of a half mile long runway. And during that time, we apply the vertical loads that, it, that the tire would see during a true orbiter landing. Tires are a critical piece of the shuttle runway equation, even more so than with commercial jets, which are actually much heavier. That's because the stress per tire on landing is much greater for the shuttle. A 747 has four tires per main landing gear, whereas the orbiter has two tires per, per gear. But because of the aerodynamics of the shuttle, uh, the tire, the individual tire loads go sometimes two to three times the individual tire loads on, say, a 747. In terms of pounds, you might see 50,000 pounds on a single tire on a 747 aircraft. Uh, for the orbiter, you can see tire load, individual tire loads uh, as high as 140,000 pounds. The stress is so great that the $4,000 16-ply shuttle tires can be used safely just six times, in contrast to the $800 747 tires, which can touch down 250 times. In fact, shuttle tires are only used once. Why jeopardize a $2 billion uh, vehicle plus a crew for a $4,000 tire? Like the tire, the surface of this runway also has to be able to handle the phenomenal stress loads of touchdown, especially in bad weather. Given the higher landing speeds and the heavier weight per tire, concern about skidding was so great when the runway was first built that it was initially coated with an astoundingly rough surface. The texture of the runway when it was originally designed and built was the most aggressive a uh, rough texture of any runway that we're aware of in the world. It was, it, and again, purposefully designed that way uh, to combat uh, rainfall rates as high as three inches an hour, which would flood any other runway in the world. This is the cheese grater surface with really aggressive transverse grooving and, and very, very rough surfaces. This is great for, for wet runway performance, but it's terrible for wear. The problem was the surface was so rough it was chewing up the tires, especially when any kind of crosswind was pushing the tires against the grain. Within the first five landings, we would see tires that had some of their carcass cords showing. There's no other airplane in the world that would perform a single landing in relatively benign conditions and yet have uh, wear into the structure of the tire. After many experiments, Langley toned down the runway surface, coming up with just the right balance between anti-skid and wear and tear. Because of the extreme levels of touchdown stress, the shuttle runway has to be one of the toughest, most stable, and crack-resistant runways in the world. Which is amazing, considering that it was built on Florida swampland and had to be solidified with compressed earth dredged from nearby canals. That foundation is topped by a six inch layer of soil cement mixture, which is in turn buried under 16 inches of solid concrete, all of which is maintained at what is virtually a 0% grade. The shuttle runway is, is built to a 
much higher standards in terms of flatness and levelness compared to the average runway at a commercial airport. All of us have seen long period dips and bumps you know, in those runways. The uh, flatness of the shuttle runway is pretty incredible. It's approximately two tenths of an inch per thousand feet, which is very, very flat. Uh, and when you consider that it's uh, in the area that it's built in, sort of a swampy area, uh, you know, with, with ground motion and so forth, uh, it took quite a bit to make it that flat and keep it that flat. Speaking of flat, one of Langley's worst nightmares involves landing the shuttle with a blown tire. In 1989, researchers tackled the question of where to land the shuttle in the event of a blowout, on the rough concrete of Kennedy or the softer, wide-open lake bed of Edwards Air Force Base. There's two schools of thought. One is uh, land on the lake bed because it is wide open and, it, and you do have a lot of room for problems. But the concern there may be are you going to dig into that surface and cause so much drag that you lose control of the vehicle? On the other side of the coin, if you're on a concrete runway, we've done tests here at our facility that have demonstrated the fact that you can adequately control the vehicle. The friction won't be too high, but you're likely to get a tremendous amount of damage because you're grinding through your tire, your wheel, your brake stack. After rigging up small-scale tests at Langley, researchers decided to stage a much more realistic shuttle blowout using a Convair 990 with a shuttle tire and landing gear mounted in its belly. The idea was, in fact, to blow the tire up on purpose and continue the test and drag the wheel and all the parts down the runway and measure the drag forces associated with that. Okay, keep the reverse on. Once it blows up, you see this tremendous uh, ball of flame behind the aircraft that doesn't stop until they pick the tire up off the ground. The flame is caused by a volatile combination of rubber and aluminum dust that gets kicked up as the tire and wheelbase scrape the concrete. Aluminum and rubber just happen to be two key ingredients of rocket fuel. Despite the damage, however, the tests proved that landing on concrete at Kennedy is controllable and relatively safe. And that's where the shuttle will touch down if it ever has a flat. Most aviation takes place in and around urban areas, where runways are hefty pieces of infrastructure that have been designed and constructed with great care. For those who like to fly on the wild side, however, runways aren't quite so reassuring. Welcome to the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness in central Idaho. 4.6 million acres of canyons and gorges where flying is a thrill and landing can seem unthinkable. Lori McNichol has been flying bush planes in Idaho's backcountry for 20 years. We have over 48 different airstrips that we can land at. And these airstrips are in the heart of the wilderness. They are cut out of uh, just the side of the hill. And when you are traveling across this vast land, which 4.6 million acres is, you are looking for one little scratch, or a lot of people say, that postage stamp is where we're going. Each landing area has some type of gotcha. And it may look great when you're circling overhead, but when you turn final, and you have to tell yourself that you're committed, that there's simply no go around here. You have to be ready, and you never know what you're gonna get. That's partly because what you're going to get is 100% natural. These runways are made out of the grass, dirt, and gravel that were found on the site. In fact, it's against the law to bring outside materials into this wilderness, or even to move found elements like gravel from one spot to another. Indeed, it's even against the law to build runways here, and most of these airstrips date from the 1930s and 40s, when pilots and backwoodsmen fashioned them entirely by hand, pulling out stumps and rocks and cutting down trees. 
they are maintained today without the use of any mechanical tools that might disrupt or seem out of place in this protected environment. Even wheelbarrows are banned. A little bit on the flat side, looking pretty good. I'm looking at that spot that I like, lining up at the end of the runway. The Soldier Bar Runway in the heart of the River of No Return Wilderness is 1,600 feet long and 4,200 feet above sea level. We have we're here. The surface consists of grass and embedded rock. Rubber strips wedged in by hand act as water bars to prevent erosion caused by rain. This runway is called Cabin Creek because it actually rests on a dried out creek bed that was painstakingly cleared of everything except the hard pan gravel on which planes now land. There are thousands of bush pilots flying into and out of hard to access parts of the US as well as the rest of the world. Alaska is still the bush pilot center of the world with some flyers bringing everything from groceries to mail to tourists to otherwise inaccessible communities. And oftentimes landing on improvised runways made out of packed snow and ice. Florida is another haven for bush pilots. Only here, the flyers specialize in taking off and touching down on water, much like aviators did with the boat planes of the 1920s and 30s. Water, surprisingly, is trickiest when it's calmest and the glassy surface is hard to read. You have no depth whatsoever, so that when you set up your descent profile and you try to focus on something, you really try hard to have some type of land or shore in view, but very often you don't. So you're waiting for that water, and uh, it's very, very important to make this landing in a quite a stick-back fashion. <laughs> Bush runways are in fact the most dangerous airstrips in the world. Every year in Idaho alone, some half dozen pilots die trying to bring their planes down. But for backcountry flyers, the danger is part of the appeal. The reason why we're all driven is because of the challenge of each runway that we approach. Each and every runway with its own set of gotchas and it's a whole new look. You can go to that same strip day after day, and it has something different to give you. And that's, that's what we love about it. It always keeps us on our toes. On our toes probably isn't the way most of us want to feel when we're about to take off or land in a 747. The runway is one part of the flying experience that we expect to have a lot of confidence in, and for good reason. These strips of terra firma, whether they be made of concrete or riverbed gravel, are an essential part of the flying equation, which is the paradox that lies at the heart of aviation. In order to get up into the air, you need to have a very firm foot on the ground. 